Good morning. Uh, today is going to be about the Middle Ages. This might be a little bit longer of a video than what I normally do, so uh, I appreciate your patience, but it's a lot of stuff to cover. So I want to start first with Christianity. Yes, um, you might be curious why it's here, but Christianity is going to very, very much shape the Middle Ages. And as it says here, Christianity defines the European Middle Ages, but it began long before the Middle Ages begin. So uh, this is a little bit of, you know, tradition, a little bit of like actual history. So if it doesn't go exactly with your beliefs, if you are somebody who considers yourself Christian, um, you know, just remember this is going to be from a more historical standpoint. Um, According to traditions, uh, Jesus of Nazareth is born sometime around 3 BC, and his teachings are going to follow traditional Jewish law, and he followed the traditional Orthodox religion, uh, but there's one major exception between he and the Orthodox Judaism of the time, and that's that he taught in his own name and not the name of Yahweh. Uh, in, he's actually going to disappoint many people who were looking for a Messiah who would deliver them from the Romans. Uh, this part of the world was under Roman rule at the time, and they were not happy about it. But uh, very famously, a quote attributed to Jesus was, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, meaning that Jesus of Nazareth is not going to worry about politics. He has a different mission in mind. Now, when you look at the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, he teaches the importance of love he, and the avoidance of violence. He is also going to be encouraging followers to um, follow the ethical meanings of Jewish laws, not necessarily the political meanings of Jewish laws. So he was not going to be a political teetotaler. He's going to do what he feels is correct and right. Now, the reactions to Jesus are very mixed. Um, some are happy with what he has to say, but there were three groups that were definitely unhappy. The first was the Pharisees, and the simplest way to explain them, the Pharisees were the strict observers of the Jewish law and the strict observers of the Torah. And they're going to have an issue with Jesus of Nazareth because he teaches in his own name and not that of Yahweh. Uh, next are the Sadducees. And they're people who live traditional Jewish culture, but they bring in Roman culture as well. And they have an issue because they only believe things that they can touch, see, and feel. So they don't believe in the spirit world because they can't see it. And they definitely don't believe in resurrection of the dead. Uh, they are going to believe just in the Jewish laws. Then you got the zealots. These are the violent revolutionaries. They're the ones who want to fight and rise up and kick the Romans out. They have an issue because Jesus of Nazareth is going to teach peace, love, and understanding. Now, members of these three groups are going to go to the Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, and... Uh, Pontius, he didn't actually have a problem with Jesus of Nazareth, according to the you know, historical record. Uh, what he said was that he was worried that a revolution was going to occur. The Roman governors of Judea were very nervous, and at the first signs of uprising, they would usually just put it down. And Pontius was worried that these three groups were going to rise up against the Romans because of Jesus of Nazareth. So Pontius is going to order Jesus of Nazareth to be arrested, and he is going to be killed to try and stop any rebellion that may happen. Now, the tradition of Jesus' physical resurrection, that is actually the foundation of Christianity. Um, it might sound controversial, but Jesus did not start a new religion. He lived as a traditional Jew. He died as a traditional Jew. And as it says, I'm speaking historically here. Uh, it's actually considered Peter's first sermon where he proclaims that Jesus of Nazareth has died for the sins of the people and resurrected to uh, live with Yahweh, where you can consider the Christianity to have begun. And Peter declares that the baptism is the mark of those who accept 
the resurrection of Jesus. Just like circumcision is the acceptance of Yahweh, baptism is going to be the acceptance of Jesus. The followers of what Peter is preaching become known as the followers of Jesus. Jesus becomes known as the Christ. And this new religion is going to spread all throughout the Middle East, actively seeking converts. It's going to spread across North Africa, eventually into Europe and Ethiopia as well. Another important early church figure is Paul of Tarsus. And it's really Paul that changes Christianity from this small subsection of Judaism into a larger religion. And Paul is very capable of speaking in, to multiple, uh, multiple groups of people, multiple cultures, because he has been in the Holy Land, he has been in Rome, he has been in Greece, he has been around. So he's a very able speaker. One of the things that Paul of Tarsus, along with Peter, are going to have to wrestle with it's the idea of um, who can be accepted. Do you have to be a Jew to become a Christian? Or can you become a Christian without being a Jew? And are Christians still subject to the law of Moses? Paul is going to answer these by preaching that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus gave a new set of laws, and that his teachings were open to everybody. And this was significant because Judaism does not and did not actively seek converts like Christianity is saying they will. Now, the appeal of Christianity is going to be very widespread, and that's because of its openness. Um, unlike many religions of the day, it was open to men and women. It was open to high class, low class. It was open to slaves and, and commoners. Um, it was open to nobles. It was very inclusive compared to other religions of the day. And then it promised a, an afterlife, a salvation, if you will, too. Um, in the Roman Empire, however, early Christians were persecuted. Um, as one example is in 64 AD, Nero blames the burning of Rome on the Christians. Uh, Diocletian is going to advocate openly for the death of Christians and have people hunt them down. And to be Christian was very dangerous in the Roman Empire until Constantine accepts Christianity at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. Now, moving on from there, uh, we got to talk about this other group, this empire called the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire, it is the last remaining part of the Roman Empire. If you remember from the Roman lecture, Rome gets so big that it is split in two. Constantine and Maxentius are going to fight the battle at Milvian Bridge. And then that separation will be made permanent and official in 395 AD. The Western Roman Empire will have continued problems with barbarians. The Eastern Roman Empire will kind of make peace with the barbarians. And the Western Roman Empire is going to end in the year 476. Rome is no longer under Roman control in 476 when this barbarian, who I believe was an Ostrogoth, named Flavius Odysseus, will declare himself king of the Romans. <clears throat> the Eastern Roman Empire is different from the Western. The Western Roman Empire is going to remain a Latin-based, Latin-speaking culture. The Eastern Roman Empire is going to maintain a lot more Greek culture. Greek will be the primary language and they will act more like the Greeks did. Uh, the Eastern Roman Empire are more people. It's worth more. It's more valuable. It's more urban. And its capital city is going to become Byzantium. Byzantium was created um, many years prior to this happening by a Greek guy named Byzus. The city of of Byzantium had burned down and was rebuilt by the Romans and so it was really the nicest and most modern city in the Eastern Roman Empire. Byzantium will be renamed Constantinople in honor of Constantine 
by his son, Constantius II. Now, Byzantium or Constantinople, whatever we want to call it, 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 it operates just like the Roman Empire. In fact, they consider themselves Roman. So there's Roman government, Roman senators, Roman laws, Roman magistrates. Everything in this Eastern Roman Empire is going to be Roman. In fact, they consider themselves Roman all the way up until, you know, the 15, 1600s. Um, <clears throat> the only reason that the Eastern Roman Empire is called the Byzantine Empire is because people in the Middle Ages kind of wanted to separate the Eastern Roman Empire from the Western Roman Empire because of their love of the Roman Empire. Lots of Byzantine emperors I can make you know, but I'm really going to just make you know two. So these two will be on the final exam. Theodosius II. Uh, Theodosius, he is going to um, be the one who creates the Byzantine Empire as its own entity, really. Um, He's going to get all of the laws from Rome. He's going to arrange them into a way that makes sense for the Byzantines. And then he's going to give those laws to the German barbarian kingdoms. And that helps keep the peace between the Eastern Roman Empire, now better known as the Byzantine Empire, and those Germanic tribes. Uh, Western Rome didn't do that. The other Byzantine emperor that I want you to know is Justinian. Justinian and his wife Theodora are going to come up with something called the Justinian Code, completely based on the laws that Theodosius II rescued from Rome. And the Justinian Code, it comes in three parts. You've got the Code, you've got the Digest, and you've got the Institutes. The Code, those are the laws. Those are the Roman laws. The Digest, it's a series of writings by judges and by lawyers that explain how the law is supposed to work. And then there is something called the Institutes. Uh, that's basically a textbook to teach law students how the, to learn the law. Uh, Theodora is significant because she was an early women's rights activist and she actually convinced her husband, uh, Justinian, to give rights to Byzantine women. All right, Christianity in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, this right here is a picture of the Hagia Sophia. And the Hagia Sophia is going to be the largest church in early Christianity, and it's the most elaborate church in early Christianity. And when the city of Constantinople is taken over by Islamic forces, it's turned into one of the greatest mosques in all of Islam. Today, if you go to the city of Istanbul, uh, you can um, tour it, and it's open as a operating mosque. It's also a religious pilgrimage site, a world heritage site, and um, a museum for both Christian and Islamic uh, reasons. Something that happens in the Byzantine Empire that's important, it's called the Great Schism. It's the first of two where um, Christianity will break apart. This Great Schism of 1054 is what creates the Eastern Orthodox churches and the Catholic churches. And there are a couple different reasons this happens, but to simplify it, uh, there was a question on who would have the power. Was it the Bishop of Rome or the Bishop of uh, Constantinople? Um, how much power that bishop had, and also if they were going to use flat bread or bread with yeast that rises during communion. Um, so that's a fairly big episode in the Christian faith there. All right, there are some questions, um, some things that you have to consider when looking at the Byzantine Empire. Number one, is it Roman? There are arguments for and against. Uh, yes, it uses Roman laws. Yes, it uses a Roman government. And yes, it was part of the Roman Empire. And yes, they consider themselves Roman. But it's not Rome. It's not Italy. It's where Asia and Europe meet. It is where modern-day Istanbul is, modern-day Turkey. Uh, Greek is their language. It's not Latin. They live more of a Greek lifestyle than they did a Roman lifestyle. And by both eastern part of the world and western part of the world, they're seen as like this other, this middle ground. So 
even historians today have questions on whether they should be considered a continuation of Rome or something new. All right, I'm going to skip this, of course, because it makes no sense to watch and go straight to the Middle Ages. <clears throat> All right, so Western Rome falls and this new society is going to develop. Um, and the Middle Ages, there's no like specific start date and end date. Uh, some people say 476 when the city of Rome is beaten, uh, going up to about 1500 or so. Uh, that's a good range to be in. In the Middle Age, it's really, it's going to be the breakdown of Roman power. Uh, Rome and the Empire of Rome, it does not disappear overnight. Uh, Flavius Odyssey, he says, I'm the king of the Romans, and things continue the normal way, according to Roman traditions, for a little while. But without that strong Roman government, things start to change. Uh, Christianity comes into Europe, and Christianity in many ways becomes the glue that holds Europe together where the Roman Empire used to. And over time, we get this new society that's based on Germanic systems, uh, Roman systems, and this Christian faith. Now, what is Germanic society? Uh, first thing you got to know is there are not really, uh, there's not a German people. It's a cultural group. It's not an ethnic group. Nobody is really an ethnic German. Um, they're smaller tribes. They're smaller groups of people who live a similar lifestyle to each other. And collectively, we call them Germans. Uh, these German societies, they have really three social classes. They've got the nobility, the people at the top. They've got the freemen, who are basically middle class. And then they've got the peasants or the serfs. And serfs, they're not free but they're not slave either. It's this weird middle ground. Germanic warriors are known to be very fierce. Uh, Germanic people, they're known for feasts. And they're known for gambling and drinking. And uh, they're also known for earning honor and prestige on the battlefield. <clears throat> Christianity is going to become a very large part of the Middle Ages, as I've said before. And the way the Middle Ages looks at Christianity, you can break it down into three parts. You've got the believers, you've got the servers, and you've got the teachers. The everyday person is the believer, the priests who will direct the people in sermons and in mass, those are the priests, and then the bishops are going to teach everybody else how it works. <clears throat> there are five bishops originally. There's the Bishop of Jerusalem, the Bishop of Antioch, the Bishop of Alexandria, the Bishop of Constantinople, and the Bishop of Rome. And as originally envisioned, all five of these bishops are equal. But over time, the Bishop of Rome becomes more equal, and the Bishop of Rome becomes known as the Pope. <clears throat> Early Christianity, it's based on the idea of the monastery. And the monastery is going to be um, you know, a small chapel led by a monk. You usually have some nuns as well. <clears throat> The monks, their only business, their only ties are to the church. They don't have any business ties or no family ties. And the monasteries are going to be where the Christian faith is perfected, um, and where it's perpetuated. It's also going to be where the knowledge of the Middle East, or not the Middle East, but the Middle Ages is kept. In the Middle East, the Islamic forces are going to have large uh, libraries. But in Christianity, it's going to be these monasteries that just keep a couple dozen books at a time. One of the first great Middle Age people you need to know is Charlemagne, or Charles, as he is, would be known today. Uh, Carol, the name Carol also comes from Charlemagne. But uh, Charlemagne, uh, he is going to be um, the person who recreates the first large-scale empire in Europe. And his empire is going to stretch from the middle of France all the way to what would be western Poland. And it says here he's a well-rounded guy. And uh, that's because he was a very good warrior, but he was also a really good politician. He was able to get people to follow him voluntarily. Uh, he tried to reform and improve Christianity, and he also started schools. 
uh, his empire, it's very decentralized. Uh, he would rule based on the idea of personal relationships. So he would go through his kingdom and he would visit the wealthy, he would ask for their support, and in return he would offer them favors. And people wanted to join with him. Uh, he defends the Christian faith to the point that in the year 800, he is crowned the Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope. And uh, this has nothing to do with the Roman Empire, so don't get it confused. Um, Charlemagne, he himself never used the title Holy Roman Emperor, but the Holy Roman Empire becomes a thing. And every Holy Roman Emperor from 800 on is going to be um, crowned by the Pope. Now, Charlemagne, he's not Roman. He is uh, from a place called Francia. He is not holy. He's not a religious figure in any way, shape, and form. He just protects the religion. And he's not an emperor. Charlemagne, he says, I'm the king of the Franks, and I am not the emperor. And then even beyond that, uh, the emperor of the Byzantines, he considered himself the Roman emperor because they thought of themselves as Romans still. So there were a lot of questions around this title. In the end, uh, he's going to reform the way the church works. He's one of the first church reformers. He releases a new version, a newly uh, uh, translated version of the Christian Bible. <clears throat> then he's going to add liberal arts to what education there was at the time. All right, uh, we also have this idea of feudalism. And you know what this is. We talked about it when we did China, but even beyond that, you know about this from movies. You got the Lord, and very often the king was the highest lord of the land. The Lord gives land away to his followers. Those followers are known as vassals. The vassals, they agree in exchange for this land to protect the king and give the king tax money. A little bit more confusing though, those vassals can give away their land and they can become lords on their own. And that's where the idea of landlord comes from, a word that we use very often today. The land controlled by the vassals becomes known as a manor. And these manors can have cities in them, they can have towns in them, they can just have a bunch of farms and fields in them. Whatever land is controlled by a vassal is known as the manor. Uh, the peasants are going to be who works the land. And the peasants have to pay taxes to the local lord. And then that local lord pays, vast, uh, pays to whoever their lord is, and that person pays to the king. Um, now, serfs, I said that they're kind of this middle ground between free and slave. Uh, laws are going to be passed that keep them on their land. They're not allowed to move. But a serf themselves, the person, the individual, cannot be sold. So a serf is a dirt poor peasant basically who is stuck on the land. They can't leave the land. That land is theirs. All right. um, that was all the beginning of the Middle Ages. When we get to about the year 1000, we get the High Middle Ages. And one of the hallmarks of the High Middle Ages is the creation of cities. Uh, cities are going to be incorporated, which means that they can do business directly with the king instead of going through their local lord. And to gain the right to do business with the king, a city has to gather together money. They have to pay off their local lord for any loss of revenue they would have. And then they have to pay the king for the right to do business directly with the king. So it's very expensive to incorporate, but there are a lot of upsides to it. Uh, one of which, that lord no longer has control of your city. Number two, you can make your own laws and control your own affairs. And number three, you're allowed then to set up these trade guilds, and they're very similar to the guilds we have today. Uh, the lowest level is an apprentice, and make sure you know this for the final exam. There is going to be a question on the final exam about this. An apprentice is the beginning level. They're somebody who is going to learn and study. The apprentice learns and studies under the master. Uh, it's like today you could have a lineman apprentice or a carpentry apprentice or an electrician's apprentice. There's somebody freshly hired trying to learn the job, and they have to work directly with the master who watches everything they do. A journeyman is the middle ground. Uh, once you have been an apprentice for a while, uh, you can start to be trusted to do your own work. Uh, you don't own your own business yet. You're not working by yourself. You can't take apprentices yet. You're kind of like a middleman. 
So you do work on your own and then a master comes and checks your work and says, okay, you're doing a good job, kid. Once you're a journeyman for a while, you can take a test and you can test to master level. And if you are a master, then you can take on apprentices and the cycle starts over. Very similar to what we have today in many industries. There's a huge struggle uh, between church and state. This struggle is going to uh, make another big contribution to the high middle ages. Uh, by the year 1000, the Catholic Church has become very powerful, but the lords and kings are becoming equally powerful. And there's this power struggle between the church and uh, political figures. For example, a king or a lord may give land to build a church, and they hand it over to the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church says, okay, we're in charge, but that lord or that king may come back and try to control the church. So this becomes a source of a lot of controversy. Um, and you might ask, why is a lord going to give their land away to the church? I've got a couple of reasons here, and they, they kind of make sense. Um, if I'm rich enough to give land to a church, people are going to say, ooh, that, that's a powerful person. Um, also, the church is going to pay and spend money to take care of the poor instead of the lord having to do it. And... By having a large church on your land, people come from miles around to see it. And you as the Lord, you can basically you know, earn tourism money. So the Lords are going to do this uh, for mostly selfish reasons, actually. Eventually, there's going to be this incident called the investiture controversy. Um, the kings and the church are so busy fighting each other that uh, they have to have a meeting. And at the end of the investiture controversy at the Council of Constance, the bishops and the Pope are going to be given control of all spiritual matters. Kings and emperors are going to be given control of all political and real world matters. <clears throat> and so the Council of Constance makes it looks, look like the struggle between church and state is going to be over, but it's never that easy. Something else is going to be on the final. I'm telling you this right now. There are three teachers I want you and need you to know. Anselm of Canterbury, Bernard of Clairvoy, and Peter Abelard. Anselm of Canterbury is going to argue that if you observe the world, something had to make the world, and whatever it was, was this great being, this creator, and that creator must be God. Bernard of Clairvoy is going to say that if you use logic to understand the world around you, that logic will enhance your spirituality. And by having that enhanced spirituality, you can easier reach the kingdom of heaven. And then finally, Peter Abelard is going to say, you can teach logic without religion. And it's Peter Abelard that frees education from the idea of religion. And from there, you get your modern day universities, your modern day uh, majors and not nearly as much Christian influence in education as there once was. Now, I mentioned that the struggle between church and state was over. It actually wasn't. Um, the Crusades are going to be a 200-year period. Uh, starting in 1095, Pope Urban II is going to call for an army to gather and take over the Holy Land from the Muslims. And that is the start of the Crusades. Now, the reason this happens is in the late 1900s, a group known as the Seljuk Turks are going to take over Jerusalem. And even though Christians are supposed to be allowed to go to Jerusalem without being hurt or bothered, the Seljuk Turks are going to make the Christians feel uncomfortable by taxing them and um, you know, just being nasty to them and things like that. The emperor of the Byzantines is supposed to protect the Christian pilgrims, but he can't afford it anymore, so he asks the Pope for help. And Pope Urban II raises his army. Now, Pope Urban II is doing this not just for religious reasons, but also political reasons to show that he has both political and spiritual power. In the end, uh, the church does raise an international army. The church does exercise political power. 
But the kings are more than happy to go along with this because they can get rid of their knights who are troubled and get rid of their second and third sons who they don't want to have inherit anything. And um, they also are going to gather and gain more control over their individual countries by getting rid of these troublesome lords and these troublesome knights. Um, the First Crusade, by the way, it's fairly successful. The Pope's army does manage to take Jerusalem. There are some Christian kingdoms that are set up, but they're all temporary. And in total, you may not know this, there are nine total Crusades. Uh, some of the other famous Crusades, the Third Crusade is considered the King's Crusade. Uh, because King Richard II of England, uh, Philip Augustus of France, and Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire are all going to go fight together. Um, of those three, only Richard II actually makes it to the Holy Land, and on his way back to Great Britain, he is captured and held hostage by the Holy Roman Empire. And if you are familiar with the story of Robin Hood, Robin Hood is robbing from the rich to give to the poor. Taxes are high. The Sheriff of Nottingham is collecting those taxes. And the Sheriff of Nottingham is collecting those taxes for Prince John. Prince John is collecting tax money to get his brother, Richard II, out of jail. Uh, also, another famous crusade is in the year 1212. There is the Children's Crusade, where some religious leaders say if children go off to fight that the holy land will be liberated and thousands upon thousands of children go to south france and they try to get on boats to go to the holy land and they're actually just going to be sold into slavery all right last but not least uh cathedrals nothing about the the middle ages shows how powerful people were and how rich people were than the cathedrals there are two different types of cathedrals shown here at the bottom the bottom right, that's a Roman-esque cathedral. That is an older cathedral. They're basically military bases that serve as churches. Stone roofs, stone walls, small windows. Uh, they're just fortresses. But when we get into the Middle Ages, the, the high Middle Ages and the late Middle Ages, we get a switch over to this Gothic design, which has arches and large stained glass windows and tall ceilings and are very fancy. Uh, there ends up being a competition between cities as to how big they can make their cathedrals. Uh, Saint Denis is considered the first cathedral. It's built in 1144. Notre Dame in Paris is built in 1163. The Cathedral Chartres is built in 1194. And then the Cathedral in Beauvais is built in 1247. What's ironic though is that the Cathedral Beauvais, it falls down because it's too big for the building ability of the day. They're trying to do something outside their means. The Cathedral Beauvais falls down a couple times and they rebuild it a couple of times. So uh, the other interesting story or, or fact for you is that in the basically 100 year period between 1200 and 1300, uh, more rock and stone is quarried out of the ground during that 100-year period than in the thousand years of ancient Egyptian history. All right, so the late Middle Ages, the Black Death happens. And um, the Black Death is this disease known as the bubonic plague, the Black Plague, the Black Death. It's all the same. And it's going to travel from Asia to Europe, and it arrives in Europe in 1347. And this disease, it begins, if you're infected, with a, a lump, a boil on your lymph glands. And if you cut open your lymph gland, you've got a chance to drain the pus and drain the infection out. You have a small chance of survival, something like 2 or 3%. Um, as the disease progressed, you would start to bleed underneath your skin, your body would turn black, you would cough up blood, the fever would be so high that you would jump in water, and you are dead usually within 72 hours of the symptoms showing. Now, your chance of getting the Black Death was about 90%. And uh, the Black Death, it comes to Europe from the city of Kaffa. Um, 
to simplify the story, there are some traders from Italy in the city of Kaffa. Uh, the city is attacked by the Mongols while the traders are there. The Mongols start flinging uh, human remains, dead people, into the city walls because those people have the plague. And the Italian traders leave and go back to Europe. And when they get back to Europe, they're pretty much all sick. So uh, it's very, very easy to transmit. 90% of people got had a chance of getting the Black Death. Of those 90% who get it, about 70% die. Um, our modern research, now that we have a better understanding of the Black Death, uh, death rates were somewhere between 50 to 60 million. The Black Death also changes forms during its year or two of existence. Um, first, the bubonic plague, 50 to 70% fatal. That's the original plague. To get that plague, you had to be bitten by an infected flea or an infected rat. Then we got the septicemic plague. That's where it becomes a bloodborne plague. Uh, you can get it from blood to blood um, mixing. That was 100% fatal. The plague mutates again and becomes an airborne plague, a pneumonic plague. That was also 100% fatal. And the Black pl Plague all the way up into World War II was still fatal if it wasn't treated with antibiotics. Now, why was it so deadly? There's no resistance to the disease. The last time anything like it had been seen was the, um, there was a plague that hit Athens at one point, and then there was a plague that hit the Byz Byzantine Empire at one point. Um, but diseases like this hadn't been seen very often. Uh, when it becomes pneumonic, it can be spread just through breathing and coughing, and it became easier to transmit from person to person. On top of that, the people are hungry and the nutrition is poor, meaning that your immune systems are weaker than they are today. And there's just, there's no sanitation. When you use the bathroom, you're throwing the bathroom remains out into the street. Here's a video you can watch on your own. It's called The Black Death Explained in Eight Minutes, if you're interested. Um, and there are many reactions. Uh, the immediate reactions, the church, uh, it's greatly affected because a good Catholic, they're going to ask for their last rites where they give their last confession. So a lot of church clergymen are with the people at their sickest right before they die, meaning that they themselves are going to get sick. Uh, as more and more people die, they're going to look for people to blame. And there are wholesale attempts at wiping out Jewish populations because... The Jews were not Christian, therefore it's the Jews' fault. And then there are some people who react with parties. It's the end of the world, and we know it. There are some who react with hardcore religion. It's the end of the world, and we need to be prepared to know it. And then there are people who just become hermits and uh, stay in their homes, and they know it's the end of the world, and they don't want to see it. Longer term, though, it's not all bad. I know that sounds weird with 50 to 60 million people dead, but the long-term reaction, it's not all bad. If you survive, there's more land for you, and it's better land. There's more food available. Um, your levels of nutrition go up. Um, there's a lack of workers, so you can demand more wages. And then in England and France, there are revolts by the peasants that are going to give them additional rights than what they had before. And then uh, there are also going to be earlier marriages uh, because marrying each other is going to become a big deal. All right, um, the Hundred Years' War, I'm going to cover that with the next lecture because it's kind of the breaking point between this and the Renaissance. And plus, I'm already 40 minutes into a video and I don't think you're going to watch all of this. So um, I do appreciate it. And um, if you watch this before... October 31st, make sure that you are working on your rough draft. Your rough draft, it is a hard deadline. October 31st, it has to be in because I have six classes worth of rough drafts to read. All right, thank you for watching. Talk to you soon.